The Mac Observers, Mac Geek Cab, episode 795, the last episode of 2019 for Monday, December 30th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to the Mac Observers Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take cool stuff found, tips, things we found, your questions. We answer them, we share them, we dissect them, we argue about them, with the goal being that everybody, us, you, everybody that's here listening, participating, learns at least five new things every single time we get together. And I believe, John, I don't have the 2020 plan because my 2020 vision is not clear. But I'm pretty sure in 2020 we are going to be sticking with the five new things as the as the uh, metric for the show. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. We'll talk about uh, how they can help you with your new Mac Pro shortly here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Hey, Mr. John F. Braun. So uh, our next episode, we're going to have Mike Bombick from uh, Carbon Copy Cloner and also former Apple employee joining us. So send in your APFS questions, your Carbon Copy Cloner questions to us at feedback at MacGeekGab.com so that we can go through those with Mike. We've got some. We'd love more. So. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, we will be you heard him. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. That's correct. Yeah. Send him to feedback at MacGeekab.com. We will be recording that episode early. We're, we're recording it on Friday before we head off to CES. So please make sure you uh, you get those in. And uh, and a big shout out. Thank you to our CES 2020 sponsors. iMazing, Otherworld Computing, which happens to also be a sponsor of this episode, as I mentioned. Text Expander. And as it turns out, and completely unrelated to the fact that, that he's coming on the show, but Carbon Copy Cloner is a uh, returning. In fact, all four of these are returning uh, CES sponsors for us. So it's great to have all of them. But, um, but yeah, 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 good stuff. And uh, who are you again? Who am I? Did I not say who I was? Oh, I, I don't think you did, because oh. I don't think I did. Huh. Oh, I thought I said here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton, but oh, maybe, maybe you did. Maybe not. I don't know. I think and I think you said who you were, too. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. maybe I did. I'm okay. pretty sure. Wait, you know what? We recorded it. We can go back and listen later. But that is John F. Braun, ladies and gentlemen, right there. Cool stuff found is where we're going to start this episode. And Bruce is going to kick us off. Bruce says in the last episode, you talked about browser plugins for downloading YouTube and other online videos. My favorite utility for this is a Mac app called ClipGrab at ClipGrab.org, available for free. You just paste your video's URL into its interface, and then you have the option of downloading it as an MP4 video or just an MP3 audio file, and you can specify the resolution and quality. They update it regularly, and it just plain works. Well, we like just plain work, so thanks for that, Bruce. Of course, that's in your show notes, which you can find at MacGeekGab.com or... If you go to MacGeekGab.com just once, you can uh, sign up for our weekly email and get all the show notes in your inbox. So then you, then you don't have to think about them, which is good. Uh, the other thing that we were talking about uh, in that same episode, and I couldn't remember off the top of my head, uh, was something that Ben reminded us of. He says, uh, I've been using Charlie Monroe's Downy, which makes it really easy to download any videos embedded on a website. So... Uh, so I'll put that in the show notes too. So thanks for that, Ben. John, I've been checking out this little C rugged SSD pro. Uh, I've got the one terabyte version. It comes in a two terabyte version. It's the size. If you took like maybe six or maybe eight credit cards and stacked them on top of each other, that's how big this thing is. It's tiny. It's an NVMe uh, SSD. It's Thunderbolt three. And I did some, Speed tests on it. Read speeds, John, I'm getting 2,600 megabytes per second. And writes, I'm getting 1,400 megabytes per second. It will work over if you're just on a USB-C interface as well. Obviously, it won't go quite that fast because USB-C doesn't go that fast. 
but um, but it will work over that. So if you you know for compatibility reasons, it's totally fine. It just 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 not gonna you're not gonna see Thunderbolt three speeds. But I think that and I think it's like three ninety nine to uh, to grab one of those. So I thought that was I'm I'm pretty stoked with it. It's a great and it's it's their rugged thing. So it's in addition to not having move, any moving parts, which is great. Um, it's also covered in like this rubberized black kind of thing so that it's, it's very, you know, shock resistant and all that good stuff. It's the kind of thing you could throw in your travel bag and not worry about, but also super fast if you need to be doing things like, you know, video editing or, or really anything. I mean, you know, faster, the better, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how, uh, how fast and and how relatively inexpensive these things are are getting i i'm i'm loving it so pretty cool huh john yeah does it is it like waterproof or dustproof or anything like that well uh, that'd be... it it is it is certainly oh ip67 rated making it resistant resistant to dust and water oh okay yep. all right yep. I'd, I'd say that's rugged then because i mean Rugged isn't really a consideration for SSDs, right? <laughs> right, right. In terms of shock resistance, yeah. I mean, it, unless you smash the thing hard enough, that unless, it's going to break yeah. it. Yeah, right. It's like going at hypersonic speeds. You're about, whereas mechanical drives tend to. Uh, yeah, it can be no bueno. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Though that's why they put that. Uh, well, I think they still have the feature, but the sudden motion sensor in some of the Macs. Oh, in the old days, they did that when they had rotational drives in them to bring the drive offline just ahead of the full impact or something. Right. So, yeah, I think they I think there was an accelerometer somewhere in the machine. And yeah. if it detected that it was uh, in falling, it would uh, pull the head back so you wouldn't scratch your. Uh, ah, that was it. That's right. Platters. Yeah. So I, that, like you said, that's that's not an issue with SSDs. But yeah. Yeah, water resistance, drop resistance, and they say that it's got three meter drop resistance. So, you know, my yeah, my guess is at some point, like you said, it will hit a velocity that that would potentially damage the enclosure. But otherwise, yeah, <laughs> pretty good. I'm stoked. I've always liked their rugged drives, but they've always been big. And this one, uh, I suppose certainly they can make it smaller without the case. Uh, and I think Seagate probably does offer something that's that, but. Um, but this thing's pretty tiny. I mean, it's, you know, fits in your palm, fits in your pocket, easily fits in your bag. So pretty stoked. It's good. Nice. We, uh, we had talked about various ways of controlling remote controlling your 3d printer. And I think it was listener Mark who brought this whole thing up. He said, I found a solution for my remote 3d printer connection and it's called the Astro box touch. They have two versions, one ready to use and one that is a kit. He says, I just plug my 3D printer USB cable into it and I can send files to it via their web browser or even their iPhone app. It connects via Wi-Fi so I can print from anywhere, not just in my house, remotely. And as a bonus, you can plug an inexpensive USB video camera into it and watch the progress. Even shoot stop motion so you can see your entire several hour build in seconds and you can plug multiple printers into it too so he sent us a link it's like he said it's the astro box touch at from astroprint.com so thanks for that mark fun stuff i love these like you know kind of just like very purpose-built things this is the beauty of of where we are with like computers and everything i love it it's good yeah, somebody mentioned something before that was, uh, I think, a Raspberry Pi based solution. So this is like doing the same thing, but it's in the cloud, which. Uh, well, it's both really cool. It, they have a right. it, there's a I mean, it's a box that connects to your printer, which probably is something similar to a Raspberry Pi. Right. Or or but but it is also linked with, like you said, their cloud service so that they can uh, so you can manage all this stuff that way. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Uh, what was the other thing we mentioned that, that you said, John, the raspberry Pi one. Oh, um, is this it? No, that's not it. All right. Well, we'll put it in the show notes. So that no, no. Uh, Octo print. Octo print. All right. There you go. Cool. Cool. Well, well, we will put that in the show notes so that you can find it at octoprint.org, I believe. 
So if you've got a Raspberry Pi, you can do some of this stuff, not probably not the video camera and, but maybe, I don't know. I don't know what the features of Octoprint are. So perhaps, uh, Michael hipped us to something that I thought we had talked about before, but I can't find any mention to it. And it's called FileBot. Uh, it is a tool for organizing and renaming all your movies, TV shows and, and other stuff, uh, other such stuff. And it will fetch subtitles and artwork so that you can feed this to, say, Plex or any other you know, movie library management system. And it's got everything that you need to really have that, have that robust experience. So you've got all your subtitles and all that good stuff just baked right in there. Um, and uh, so it's at filebot.net. And it seems really interesting. I've, I haven't tested it yet, but I, I want to because I wind up manually renaming things a lot for my, um, for my various stuff. And they have a Synology NAS package available so that it could be done right on my Synology, John. So that makes this really interesting. So we need to, we need to check this out, John. But we'll, yeah, uh, I've, I've had to, um, so I installed the uh, Plex client on a couple of my devices. Sure. And um, one thing I had to do, there was one movie that the, um, usually it takes the title of the movie and makes it the file name when you rip it. Right. But I had one where it misidentified the movie because I, I think the, the word the was either in there or not in there. And it, sure. it brought up the totally wrong movie. At least the Plex client has a selection um, where you can basically say, uh, no, 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 that's not it. It's it's that movie. Right. Uh, I the the web video client station does that. The web client does. No, video station. You can do that, too. You can you can fix an incorrect match with Synology's oh. video station as well. Yeah. I yeah. wasn't able to figure out how to do that. I, it was more obvious with the Plex client. Yeah. it And even in the Plex client, to be honest, I you're, I mean, it's there, but you've got to like dig into the movie. And I, I don't know that it's in the client. I've only ever found it in the Plex server web interface, not on like, I don't, I don't think I've ever been able to fix a match on my iPhone. I've always had to do it on the web, but maybe I'm not finding it there, but on the web you go in and go to your, you know, movies and then you right click like, um, uh, you know, there's like the three dots or something and there's an option to fix match or rematch yes. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to find that on like my iPhone or in the Mac client. Were you? Huh? I mean, maybe it's no, there. I think it, was, I think it was the Apple TV client or the TiVo client. Oh, the TiVo client. No, that's super feature limited. That's okay. It must, that, have, it must have been the Apple TV. Uh, app. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I'm looking here on my iPhone and I don't see any way to, uh, to, you know, to change a match. Even if I hit the three dots, it's like I can play or I can delete. That's it. So, yeah. But yes, this Filebot thing, it's, it's not going to deal with, well, maybe it will help deal with m missed matches, but that's up to the, you know, the server software to, to do its matching there. But at least this will get all your right subtitles and all that and name it correctly because a lot of times when you pull in something like if you rip a movie from your your blu-ray or whatever it just doesn't get named the right way and this can kind of help do it so pretty stoked about that um a gentleman named chuck pedal passed away uh recently i think it was on december 15th i had no i, I had never heard his name before and had no idea what he did of course uh in 1974, he and several other engineers were designing a new silicon chip at Motorola when the company sent them a letter demanding that they shut the project down because Chuck Peddle was designing a low cost chip that he, in his thought, could bring digital tech to the masses. But his bosses saw it as unwanted in-house competition for their three hundred dollar processor again, $1974, so $300 was not inexpensive, uh, that they had unveiled that year. So he and his engineers quit and moved the entire project to MOS technology or MOS technology. Uh, and they built a processor called the 6502 that was priced at $25 in 1974. 
And that chip powered the first wave of truly personal computers, including the Apple II and the Commodore PET. And an interesting thing is that um, in 1976, MOS was acquired by a calculator company at the time, Commodore Business Machines. And Mr. Pedal was named its chief engineer. Soon after, uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak offered to sell Apple to Commodore. But Commodore declined. Of course, they were using this chip in the uh, early Apples and Apple IIs. So uh, after they declined, the Commodore business machines built their own personal computer around the 6502, which was called the Commodore Pet, which sold for $495. And uh, so Chuck Peddle, like without him and, and his team of engineers, but certainly without his vision, I don't know where the personal computer revolution would have begun because that $25 chip is what made it possible to get these things into people's homes. So I thought that was pretty cool. And when I saw it, I wanted to share because, you know, it's kind of a geeky thing. Had you ever heard of Chuck Peddle, John? Um, I know some of the history of the 6502, but yeah. um, no, it didn't jump out at me as uh Yeah. Well, now I know. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I remember fiddling with, you know, it, you know, if you had an Apple II, then they actually had an assembler you could get to and you could write your own 6502 code. And honestly, it was, uh, I would say the risk processor of it, of its day and that it had very, you know, it had lots of little instructions, the, uh, reduced instruction set computing, right. Um, which is what risk stands for, right? Was the uh, yeah, which was the parad uh, one of the paradigms back then. It's like you know, do you make a really complex chip with you know, like the Intel chips with you know tons of instructions, or do you make one that's kind of elegant, has uh, smaller little instructions, right? Interesting. So okay. I would kind of consider it a risk processor compared to the other things that were out there at the time. That makes sense. I hadn't yeah, I hadn't even thought of it that way. Wow. Huh. Interesting. See all the things we learned. I like it. Yeah. No, the 6502 is, I mean, yeah, that was, that was what, that's what we all started with, with our Apple twos and, and our Commodores. I didn't, I guess at the time I knew that the Commodore 64 was based on the same chip, but I certainly had lost that reference until I read this article too. So. Oh man. I remember servicing those things that they had, that the C64 had a terrible failure rate. Really? Well, they had, they had, well, they had, uh, I repaired more than one of them. And I, I remember, well, it usually it was the power supply failed because they had that external. Oh, they had like a, a brick. Yeah, the uh, right, right. Yeah, and th those had a high failure rate from what I recall. Because yeah, people are like, it's not working anymore. It's like, yeah, it's your, your power supply shot. Here's a new one. And where were you repairing these things? What were you, what were you doing? Oh, this was, uh, oh, this was back, uh, Oh gosh. Like in the in the eighties, I worked at a little place called Small Computer Service Center. Uh, I think you visited me once. I did. I remember visiting you there. Yeah, for sure. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And we did um uh the the uh the owner was a teacher in the local school system and her uh husband um haven't talked to him in ages. So. Yeah. And and her husband was a uh engineer and uh at a, a Perkin Elmer. And oh, okay. Taught me many things, including doing component level repair. <laughs> that That's cool, huh? Yeah, huh. on Apple IIs and PCs and and all of that. Yeah, it was a fun gig. That's cool. You um, you did was it you that was telling me that Bill Gates walked into your small computer shop, or was that somebody else that was telling me that back in the? No, it was me Meatloaf. Well, I know, I know Meatloaf was one of your, your gaming customers, but I, th I thought, okay, I must, I must have conflated the story. Somebody else worked all, you know, another friend worked at a small computer shop and they said Bill Gates came in peddling his, you know, latest stuff from Microsoft because that's what you do. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But I remember, yeah. Um, cause yeah, his name, he, you know, his, uh, when he came in to, you know, I think he had, we you're talking, you're talking about Meatloaf again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But but his real name is Marvin Aday, I believe. Okay. Um, All right. But yeah, that that was the name on the slip, and I didn't know that. And then at one point, he's like, "Oh, uh, I'm Meatloaf." I'm like, 
wow, the meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't really into into meatloaf at the time, but he uh, he had a he had a well, he has had a fantastic career. He uh, and and his first album uh, helped Todd Rundgren launch his uh, career, f- fuel his career too. Todd Rundgren got a fantastic mm-hmm. deal publishing uh, or producing Meatloaf's first album. Totally. Now we're off on like a tangent of a tangent, but uh, they wanted Todd to produce what became you know, Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell, huge album. And they knew they needed somebody that like understood not only rock and roll, but like theater and, and performance and that because it's a weird record. You know, it's not your typical like just throw a band in the studio and, and run it. I mean, it's this very theatrical rock and roll opera ish kind of thing. And so they kept going to Todd and Todd's like, no, you don't have enough money to pay me. You don't have enough money. And finally, they said to him, all right, we'll give you some base rate, which I think was like $30,000, which, okay, you know, decent amount of money back then. And we'll pay you a dollar for every record that's sold. A dollar. Like, nobody gets a dollar. Meatloaf didn't even get a dollar for every record that was sold. Todd did. Todd has a really nice house in Hawaii now. And, you know, I think he finally sold off future rights to that. Uh, for a lump sum payment, maybe 10 years ago or something to help. Actually, I think to help purchase the, the help finance the purchase of his house. But, um, but yeah, it's a good thing for him. All right. Uh, well, that was a quite a, a departure for Christmas. I got a new Apple watch, uh, which means I went from an OG watch, like literally a watch that was delivered on release day and somehow had yet to have any battery problems, which is, amazing to me everybody else that i know is that got watches on release day if they were still using them had the swelling battery problem i i did not yet uh but anyway got this uh watch series five which uh, I'm, I'm actually quite liking i like the fact that the screen's on all the time which is nice and of course this means now that i can run watch os5 and i noticed some things because there are other people in my house that have watches that at least prior to christmas were much much newer than mine and we're also running Watch OS 5. And there are some features touted by Watch OS 5 that were not set up automatically for me or anyone else in my household. So there's a there's a few of them. The one that that is the feature that convinced me that I wanted a new Apple Watch finally after all these years is the noise app, which is a, a sound or an SPL meter, a decibel meter, if you will, built into the watch. I am obsessive about protecting my hearing and I like the idea of having an SPL meter, not just with me all the time, but warning me when I'm in a range where the sound is loud. If, for example, you're in an environment where the sound is above 90 decibels, more than 30 minutes of that can cause, you know, potentially cause permanent damage. So it's a good thing to be aware of. I just like the idea and let's face it. It was also time for a new Apple watch. So, uh, but that is not that's not on by default, believe it or not. And you have to go turn it on. So for the noise uh, notifications to work, you do it on your phone. Uh, the watch is, of course, managed by the phone, but more and more of the watch is managed on the watch. So this stuff gets a little crazy. But you launch the watch app. Uh, you go to your My Watch tab and then scroll down and tap on noise. And then you can set a noise threshold for when you want to be notified and uh, and I have mine set at 90 decibels. So when the sound average uh, over a three minute period exceeds 90 decibels, it lets me know. Uh, and then you can you can, of course, turn those things off there, too. But it's worth going and then also launch the noise app right on your watch. It's an, a yellow icon of a human ear this is what it looks like. Go launch that there so that you can configure it there, too. So that that's the first one that I set up. The next one was the whole uh, ECG, the electrocardiogram. You have to set this up, too. And it does not just happen by default. In fact, I didn't even think about it until I finally started until it hit me. It's like, wait a minute, this will do that. Uh, How come it hasn't been offered to me? And I didn't restore my watch from a backup. I set this one up brand new. Uh, so I would have thought it would have maybe walked me through some of this, but it did not. So to do that, you launched the health app on your phone and then you should see once you launch the health app for the first time, it should have something on the first screen there that 
that turn that allows you to turn that on. Uh, if you don't see it, go to browse and then go into heart. And in there, you should see ECG or electrocardiograms, and then you can set those up. And you've got to go through a little process of taking an EKG, which uses the uh, crown on the watch to connect both sides of your body and do all of its stuff. So that's another good one. And lastly, the walkie talkie feature is pretty cool on the watch, but you also need to set that up. And in order to do that, you do this. I did mine on the watch. Uh, just launch the walkie talkie app, which is a yellow icon with, um, I mean, it looks like a handheld radio if you know what that might look like, but otherwise it's like a box with a circle in the middle of it. Uh, it kind of looks like an Apple watch with a circle in the middle of it, but with like a little nub of an antenna sticking off. It's yellow. That's the walkie talkie app. Launch that. And from there, you can add other people or invite other people to link with you for walkie talkie, because what walkie talkie does is, let's say John and I both had watches that supported it. I could if once we're linked together, I could just hit the walkie talkie button and my voice now will start coming out of your watch, John. It's not like you don't answer the. It's not a call. It's an it's an announcement. So you got to kind of choose wisely who you want to uh, give this power to if you're in mute mode or theater mode or whatever then it won't do it but otherwise yes so those are my those are my three things to turn on i'm sure there's more that i'm missing uh but but i figured and nobody on my house had had, had my wife my wife had had the noise thing turned on because that was of interest to her as well when she got her watch or when watch os5 came out but she didn't have walkie talkie set up and um and my so my son and i needed to set up our well, he he also got a watch uh series five watch because he too was on an og so uh, we had to set up all this stuff and it just wasn't obvious it was kind of surprising that there was nothing to walk me through like hey here's your new features you should do all this stuff like no go find it for yourself so i thought maybe folks out there would not have found it even if you've had watch os5 since the fall uh you may you may not have known about at least some of these so there you go you're still a non Apple Watch using person, right, John? Correct. Okay. Any questions about any of this? No, it's it's getting better and better. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. I like it. It's good. Hey, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at Otherworld Computing. Well, at MaxSales.com. Are they at? I, I, they must be at OtherworldComputing.com, right? Uh, let, let's look at that. Dot com. Let's see. Are they smart enough? They, Of course, they are smart enough to do that. They're smart people there. So MaxSales.com is, though, where you want to go. And as I mentioned in the intro to the show, Otherworld Computing is ready to help you upgrade your new Mac Pro. They will let you max out the new 2019 Mac Pro and save you up to 65% versus the factory RAM that Apple would sell you. So when you're ordering your new Mac Pro, I know it's fun to go online and see how expensive you can make it. That's cool right up until the moment that you're going to purchase. Then ratchet that way back down by taking off all the RAM you can and go to Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com to max out your RAM because they offer up to 1.5 terabytes. Terabytes, John, can you imagine that? Yes. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> uh, 1.5 terabytes for the new Mac Pro. And they have more configurations than Apple does. It's crazy. Nice. It's crazy. I know. Yeah. Uh, what comes after that? Petabytes, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe we'd go from, yeah, from terabytes to petabytes. It would, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I'm you sure know, on it. it's not just your Mac Pro that Otherworld Computing will sell you RAM for. In fact, the RAM that I have in all of my Macs here uh, all came from Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. They've been offering memory upgrades for years and they understand this stuff. You know, it it's crazy how deep they go into all of this. They maintain a state-of-the-art test lab that we got to see last year, and they ensure their memory upgrades offer the highest quality and reliability by backing them with their OWC Lifetime Advanced Replacement Program and a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you got to check this out. 
Go to MaxSales.com. Or if you want, go to OtherworldComputing.com. If that's easier to remember, it's fine. That will bring you to MaxSales.com, as we just found out, and get your RAM there. Get all your other stuff there, too. That's where John and I shop first for anything we need to add to our Macs. Our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode and doing what they do. All right, Mr. Braun, let's go on to some questions, shall we? It's been a little while since we've done some questions. In fact, it's been, you know, well, at least 30 minutes of this episode. So we will go and start with Jason. And Jason, I, I, this, this is such a good question. Uh, he says, can you explain the difference between RSS readers versus RSS services? In other words, why do I need Feedbin, Feed Wrangler, etc., and Reader 4? Reader 4 being an app for Mac OS and iOS. It says Reader 4 allows me to sign up for an RSS feed directly. What does Feedbin or any of the others do? Feedbin also has their own reader for RSS feeds. At first, I thought the RSS services were like an email provider and the reader apps were the client or the email client that you use. He says, but that doesn't seem to be quite the right analogy. He says, I hope this question makes sense. It does. Um, and you're what right. What is RSS? Good question, John. You want to answer that? You want me to answer it? Well, I think it's a real simple syndication is what it stands for. And I think it's just a standard way of representing news articles. Well, right? not just news articles. In fact, most of the people that are listening here are using RSS, whether you know it or not, because podcast subscriptions are also published in RSS. But it is you're right that it is a standard format to uh, publish and then also read or parse uh, any sort of article. You're right. It, it News articles is where it started and certainly is where it is uh, popularly used right now. But uh, podcasts are, you know, a pretty big use case as well. In fact, arguably, probably a bigger use case than than news articles, because so many people listen to podcasts. And my guess is that not that the same percentage of, of people use RSS for news. The nice part about using RSS for news is that, you know, we at Mac Observer, we publish our articles via RSS, but also on the Web. And so you could certainly go to the website and read at Mac Observer, and then you could go to, uh, you know, Apple Insider and read there and Daring Fireball and read there, you know, whatever you want. And New York Times and read there if you like. But if you want to pull it all together into one app that you curate, then an RSS app is or an RSS service is the place where you could do that because you could subscribe to all four of those and many, many others and organize them the way you want, read what you want. And now you've got it all in one interface that that works really nicely for you. And I use RSS quite a bit for just parsing through things, seeing trends and headlines and things like that. Um, I use Reader, uh, the app that Jason mentioned, and I also use a service called Feedbin. Um, but I use Reader, the app, for most of my RSS reading on either, you know, Mac OS or iOS or iPad OS now. Um, but what I use Feedbin for is to sync all of my subscriptions. And occasionally I will use their interface on the web. But I have Reader set to log in and sync with Feedbin on all my devices. So I don't have to worry if I read something on my phone and then I launch Reader or any other RSS app on my Mac that is linked with Feedbin. I know like I don't see that same article because I've because I've already read it. Now, of course, if I mark it as starred or flagged or something, then I will see it that way. So it is like the email provider backend service that adds a bunch of features to what would otherwise just be a sort of standalone client. And um, I, I've, I've been a, a, a user of Feedbin for years and years. It just makes life so much easier to have a service. And I think it's only, I don't know, 20 or $30 a year. It's not, it's not a huge expense. Although like we talk about here, you know, those, those little sort of, smaller subscriptions add up and you know what what is it death by a thousand razors or death by a thousand cuts or something like that so uh but i that, so that's that's what i use it for and i hope that answers your question jason but uh any any other stuff you want to add to this mr braun uh no okay it's uh i, I don't yeah that's not the way i consume news Though underneath the covers, it may be doing RSS. What What do you What, how, what do you mean by that? Um, well, like a, 
so I have a few apps. So, so one is Apple's news. So I use that and I get notifications of things. And then we have a couple of local publications that um, also will put up not- um, notifications under iOS or actually, well, news works. Uh, news does it on the Mac and yep. on iOS. Um, but I also have some clients on that are iOS only. Uh, one is... Uh, we have a, a local thing called Daily Vo- uh, Fairfield Daily Voice, I think, mm-hmm. which is like Fairfield News. Sure. And another another one that I found that also posts uh, local news called News Break. Interesting. So, so that's how I get my news. Now, I wonder if they're aggregating via RSS. I, I bet they probably are. It's I, I, Apple News. Um, so Apple News can aggregate via RSS. When it started, that's how we published to it. Um, was it would essentially just slurp uh, an RSS feed. We created a, a pretty custom one that just Apple News knows the URL for and they can they can slurp. But we have since changed and now we push new articles up to Apple News via JSON. So when we get a new article out, it uh, pushes it, J- JSON, I think is JavaScript object notation or I'm making that up, but it's a way it's again, another standard format where you can package up something and send it to an endpoint at a, at a web server. And so we just push those to Apple news and it, that way it has it immediately. And if we need to make a change or we update the article or something, we can, you know, that push sort of happens automatically uh, with this, this engine that we use now. So, okay. Yeah, you were right. JavaScript object notation oh, is a lightweight data interchange format. So okay. it's like RSS, but it is it, RSS almost in reverse <laughs> because you're pushing instead of pulling, although you could do a JSON pull. So yeah. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we use, we use JSON. Yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, you're right that Apple news is doing for, uh, is doing what what RSS does for a lot of people, whereas it's aggregating your chosen news sources together. And if you like the Apple News interface and you like the services that are available there, then that works really well. And it's, of course, you know, packaged up in a way that is much more uh, user friendly to get started with. RSS isn't terrible, but, you know, it takes a little it, it, it's a little bit geeky to you know, say, oh, I want to subscribe to the RSS feed of that website or something. It's not that it's not terrible, but, you know, yeah, there you go. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Michael has a question. He says, I'm thinking of retiring my 2013 six core Mac Pro, and I'm amazed that my 2018 six core Mac mini specs faster than my Mac Pro Xeon. The only real negative is that I use three Thunderbolt ports with J- with daisy chain devices, three external large storage drives, two large displays, and occasionally other external storage devices. As I can't find one, do you know of a Thunderbolt 3 device that supports multiple Thunderbolt inputs? I do have several Apple Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapters, and I can buy more if needed. So, you know, the thing... Um, in terms of the speeds uh, between those two machines, you're right that the CPU in your 2018 Mac Mini is is faster than your 2013 Mac Pro. But you know that that sort of makes sense. I mean, time as as the way time works, it's entirely likely though that the GPU in your old Mac Pro outpaces the on chip GPU of your Mac Mini. Now, of course, with a, a Thunderbolt three device or a computer like the Mac Mini you can add an external GPU and mitigate that. But just bear that in mind for anybody that's, you know, doing these comparisons. Um, All that said, your migration question is a good one. It's possible that your displays are Thunderbolt. Some, there are, there are a handful of displays that are truly Thunderbolt displays, but my guess is that they are just using mini display port, which is the port over which Thunderbolt one and two are sent. And that makes a big difference here because you don't need if that's the case and they're just display port devices or HDMI devices, you don't need Thunderbolt ports to connect to them. You just need either display port or HDMI to connect to them. Um, and with that in mind, take a look at what you need and then go find a Thunderbolt three dock 
that serves your purpose. And this is the beauty of, of, you know, what we call dongle world or dock world. There are so many different, especially with Thunderbolt three, so many different permutations of docks and, and dongles out there where you can say, okay, I need, you know, three display ports or two, maybe because you're going to use one that's, you know, baked into the Mac mini. Great. Okay. So I need a, a Thunderbolt three dock with two display ports and X number of, of, uh, you know, USB a ports or USB C ports or whatever it is. And you can bake it all together and get what you need. You probably will still have your storage devices. You say you're using those with Thunderbolt two. take a look at the speeds that those devices can deliver you and decide whether they need to remain being used over Thunderbolt two, or if not, I would highly recommend moving them to USB three. The Thunderbolt 2 to Thunderbolt 3 adapters, in my experience, have been a little wonky. Use them when you need them, but otherwise do not use them. Uh, and if in a in case like this, if your drives support USB 3 and you're not losing any speed by jumping to that, then I would highly recommend jumping to that just to be as native as possible. Uh, and that that conversion from 3 to 2, at least in my experience, has been very, very sort of flaky but um but you know do it where you need it and otherwise don't do it so those are my thoughts on this john do you have any any thoughts on any of this mm. um i may in the next question okay all <laughs> which right kind of has uh some thunderbolt involved in it i think right uh i don't know take us there let's see well, okay all right so this is um martin and Martin writes, got an interesting problem I'm hoping you can help with. It's been going on for a couple of years, but hasn't really caused me many issues, so I haven't bothered with it. The problem first occurred on my iPhone 7 when I connected it to my MacBook Pro 15-inch Retina 2015. And thank you for being specific with the machine model, because that helps us do our thing. Um, the phone would rapidly start connecting and disconnecting, stopping the phone from charging and syncing properly. I managed to solve this by resetting location and privacy after using some Google Foo. Okay. However, the problem soon returned. After then upgrading to an iPhone 10, the problem persisted from day one of owning the new iPhone. The same thing has started happening to my iPad Pro 12.9 first generation. Recently upgraded in Again, wow, this guy's going through phones like crazy. Uh, I upgraded again to an iPhone 11 Pro. And would you believe it? Yep, the same problem out of the gate. With some more Google Foo, I have learned that the USB-D process is causing the problem. And either force quitting the process or using some terminal command to stop or kill the process will make the problem go away until next plugged in. However, after killing the process, my iPad Pro will not charge. It displays not charging next to the battery. However, I can still sync with the finder just fine. Any ideas on what I can do to stop this from happening? It seems silly to have to kill the process every time I plug in my iPhone. Even stranger, this does not happen with any of my family's Apple devices. Um, everyone having an iPhone watch an iPad. But only my devices seem to be affected. All right. Uh, th this will be a good one because I, I think I'm going to go in a different direction than you would, Dave, here. Mm. So the first thing that I didn't suggest, but... Um, Whenever you have a problem that seems to be power related, which I think this is, resetting the SMC cannot hurt. Oh, yeah. For, yes. Yeah. When it seems like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. And they even mentioned that. And you, you'll find the article, I'm sure, that tells you how to reset the SMC. So that may fix it. Um, other than that, I'm going to, you may want to run some sort of diagnostic. And I'll have two tools here that, that can kind of help you isolate if it's a USB issue or not. So one, um, there's something from Micromat called MacCheck, okay. uh, which you can download. And it does some basic checks here. And one of the checks that it has is an IO check. I would run this and see if it thinks there's anything funky with your USB stuff. Uh, the other tool that I find useful for diagnosing these things, Dave, is our friend Hardware Growler. And I have had that confirmed that I had a USB issue at one point because uh -huh. what it, uh, Hardware Growler will show you, um, one of the things it can show you is when a USB device 
connects or disconnects. The OS may not report this, but Hardware Growler does. Um, and I used it in the past to diagnose a USB issue because I would see pretty much what he was seeing is that it would, it would come, it would go away, it would come back, it would go away. And I think it finally resulted in a repair um, or motherboard replacement because it was something with the USB ports. So, yeah, killing off. Now, now the, the, I find this interesting when, when he says he kills off USB D. What is USB D, you may ask? Well, if you go in the terminal and you type man, which is the manual page, USB D, one of the things it says, Dave, is the USB D allows the system to configure USB iOS devices to charge and to present notifications related to USB devices. Killing that off, I think, is why he gets that uh, where it's not able to charge anymore because I think Makes the sense. process that configures the USB chip is now not running anymore. So he can't charge. <sighs> Okay, so this, is, this just, is this is interesting though, right? Let, let's let's look at because knowing that killing USB D off fixes this for him is good. And USB D, as you just said, does two things: configures the charging and also allows USB devices to present notifications. Okay, let's compare that or let's factor that in to the thought process that this only happens with devices that are his not his family members. So what is the difference between those sets of devices? Well, I mean, there's probably lots of differences. One of them, though, is likely that these devices are signed in. His devices are signed into his Apple ID, his same Apple ID, and his family's devices are probably not signed into his same Apple ID. So what is it? That his devices are trying to do because it sounds like it starts to work and then it stops. Right. Then you get this disconnect loop, but it only happens with his devices. So what is it about either his Apple ID? Are they trying to send some notification because his Mac is also connected to that same Apple ID or, you know, that that his family's devices, the Mac would be like, oh, yeah, no, these are different devices. So let's treat them differently. I wonder I, like that to me, that's where that that's where the stink is on this one. Right. It's like, well, why is it just his devices? And certainly it's any of his devices, new ones, old ones, doesn't matter. I would wonder, you know, you said he goes through a lot of iPhones. I wonder if he rolls them around. Right. Like if he takes his you know, old iPhone and gives that to one of his family members, once that process has happened, does that old iPhone, which previously had a problem on this machine, now not have a problem on this machine once it's being used by a different family member? I, I, this is just one of those, you know, there, there's something wonky going on software wise here that's causing this to get like flaky about certain devices when they are configured a certain way. Uh my gut says to, well, a couple of things. Number one, uh, try loading the combo updater. Although I'm going to guess that this has persisted across a couple of different OS versions, right? Because that 2015 MacBook Pro can run Catalina. So I'm assuming that this problem didn't start with Catalina, that maybe it was there for Mojave and perhaps even older stuff. Although I'm, that's a presumption I'm making based on uh, just a guess. So, but I, but I wonder if it's ever been wiped clean. So, you know, clone your drive off or, or create a, a new drive, you know, trying all of the sort of ice, troubleshooting isolation things, create a test user, see if it happens with that test user when it is and also isn't logged into your iCloud account, right? That might, that might be a, a it, that might help us narrow this down. And if you wipe the drive or start with a fresh drive, if you're booting from an external or something, does the problem happen? Is it something about, you know, is there some preference file that for whatever reason is getting wonky because your phones are trying to do some extra communication that is, you know, not uh, not going to happen? Or is it see the charging thing? The charging thing would also be an issue with other non devices that aren't his. Right. Because it's either charging or not charging. So I don't, yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know. It's interesting. It's a fascinating well, one. It's another thing. I don't know. My gut just tells me I could be wrong, but it may be a hardware issue. So, so there's two, two ways you could deal with that. Now, one, you could go to your friendly local Apple authorized service provider or Apple store and have them test it, which I assume they have the tools to test it. And maybe your USB ports are shot. But if I they were shot, leaning towards software and I don't understand that. But well, but if they were shot, just, wouldn't they be shot with all hardware, not just the hardware that's logged into yeah, his I, iCloud I, I account? See, I see your point. You know what I mean? Like, like I, you, you, you could be right. Like hardware problems can be a, a bear to diagnose because generally hardware problems don't present 100 percent of the time. Obviously, if you have a dead power supply, well, OK, that does unfortunately present 100 percent of the time. But but there are lots of hardware problems that are, you know, triggered by heat or other, you know, external or even internal factors that make it so that it's inconsistent, which is why I always say if something is inconsistent, start thinking hardware, you know, whereas if it's consistent mm -hmm. software and this seems like freakishly consistent, it's like his devices, no other people's devices. Yes. So to me, that's not that doesn't have the stink of hardware on it, but it could be, it, you know, again, it, it could just be coincidental, right? Maybe. He's I don't know how often he's plugging in his family's devices versus his devices. And maybe this problem isn't presenting often enough. Like it could, you know, just could be coincidental. So I don't know. Right. Um, so anyways, you know, if, if you have a service provider, you know, they'll, they'll probably offer to test it for you and then give you advice on what to do. It's it's a, it's listed as a supported machine, so they should be able to. I don't know if they still do flat rate, though. I was looking for info on that. I know they used to charge like $300. And then I found a post from a couple of years back that said for that class of machine, it was more like $500. Ooh, yeah. But um, yeah, and you may not want to dump that much money into an older machine. The only thing that I noticed, Dave, is that this machine has a Thunderbolt 2 port. And you okay. can get a Thunderbolt to USB 3 adapter. Doc. Well, no, it's, it's an adapter. Uh, uh, look at the look at the thingy that I I came up with. Okay, I mean it's a dock though. It's not they, like Thunderbolt th Thunderbolt two doesn't have a USB chip in it. So whatever you plug, whatever you want to call what you plug into it, is adding a USB chip to the chain. I always just call that a dock. But sure, yes, yeah, but yes, fair, yeah. It's Thunderbolt two on one end, and then it has an eSATA and a USB three port. Yep, yep, makes sense. I mean, sense. you could try something like this and see if the USB then works, in which case it would. So, so um, Brian Monroe in the chat room pointed us to something very interesting. Uh, it's an iFixit article that is talking about this exact problem. Uh, when mm. I plug my iPad Air into my MacBook, it acts as though I'm plugging it and unplugging it rapidly, and it won't stay connected long enough for me to sync or back up. And the fix that, you know, dozens of people have said, oh, this also fixed the problem for me, is something that Martin mentioned. And that is, go in on your iOS device, says, go to Settings, General, Reset, and Reset Location and Privacy. So I think it is that his devices are trying to sync some data that is maybe corrupted or something's mm -hmm. corrupted on his Mac. But uh, but it seems like there's something about location and privacy. And people are saying, you know, like there's like I said, there's dozens of comments saying, you know, I've been looking for a solution for over a year. This did it. Um, and it seems like these same people are having the. uh USB-D, killing off the USB-D process also fixes this for them as well. Uh, so it seems like whatever this privacy location handshake thing is, happens only when the USB-D process is running. So maybe it's more than just power and notifications. Mm. Maybe there's one yeah. little extra piece of something. So this is fascinating. Um, okay, so it's getting stuck because yeah, you you and I have both seen that before. It's like, hey, you want to trust this device that I don't know about anymore? Right. It's like, uh, please. 
So maybe it's getting stuck in that dialogue. Okay. Yeah, like there's it. like a right, maybe maybe it is a software thing. Uh, it, like I said, it 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 smells of software to me. This is really interesting. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I wish I I wish I knew why this would be the way it was. Uh, you know, why, like why, why resetting privacy fixes that or location could be either one of them. Yeah. Speaking of location, listener Steve has um, he has a very interesting question. Steve says, uh, my fiance has to prove in court that she isn't the person named in a lawsuit. The incident in question happened in 2015. Uh he says, I found that Google Maps has a function called timeline that keeps track of your location for the last 10 years. If we could prove where she was at the point in time that this happened, she could extract herself from this lawsuit. Unfortunately, on her iPhone 8, she did not enable the Google timeline function. He says, I did also look in system privacy or system preferences, I guess, privacy, location services, system services, significant locations. But that only goes back about a week, at least on her phone. Do you have any other suggestions that might have this information so that we can prove it wasn't her? So this is a crazy scenario. Um, thinking about other things. Yes. You, you know, he suggested maybe calling Verizon to see if they have records. That would certainly be something. Uh, you could probably, you know, issue them a, a request for data or a subpoena or something like that to to get that. You know, you would do that through your attorney. Um, and that's certainly worth exploring, I would think, because that would give you, you know, some uh, third party corroboration that that she was where she actually was, not where this person who's suing her thinks she was. Uh, if she sent any emails from that time frame. Those might have the IP address of the device that she used to send them and IP addresses, especially if they were sent over a cellular network, can sometimes at least get, you know, sort of what I'll call rough location down. Uh, so that might be helpful if she uses Facebook. You know, we complain a lot. I don't not hear because we try to stay out of the politics of tech. Uh but, you know, in general, we complain and are very aware of the fact that Facebook is constantly tracking and logging our location, uh, especially when you make posts. So it's possible that something there could prove your location in relation to time. Twitter is the same way. You can choose to tag your location when you post a tweet. If she did that, that might be able to, you know, she might be able to narrow things down. Uh, any other thoughts, John? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of other ways that our location. I mean, this is sort of a creepy thing, right? I mean, I get that in, in this case, Steve wants her location to have been tracked without her, you know, direct involvement. Uh, of course, th the more answers we come up with, the more we're all going to sit here and be like, oh, crap. Like this is the, the ship has already sailed. Pandora's box is already wide open. So, yep, yep. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Well, as, you, as you mentioned, um, yeah, so if you check into a place with Facebook, uh, there's another app, um, Foursquare, and then they they have like kind of a, a, a mini spinoff called Swarm, which I uh, still use along with some friends. So I didn't like, even realize Foursquare was still a thing. Huh. Go well, figure. Swarm links to it. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Foursquare has... Huh is I guess the heavy client, if you will. And okay. Swarm is kind of the, the lightweight thing. I thought they went out of business. Like I didn't even realize that was still a thing. Huh. Fascinating. All right, cool. Um, and the other thought is, do you have any photographs from then? And Ooh. do you have a camera that has a GPS in it? Well, the phone would have a, a GPS in its camera. So if she took any pictures with her phone, the metadata of those pictures would show where she was. Right. And in it addition, would show the timestamp. Like yeah. Yeah. And my, my camera has um, and a lot of cameras these days have a, a point and shoot cameras have a GPS in there, too. So, I mean, I suppose you could forge that, you know, kind of like the time and date stamp on something. But, you know, if you have enough data points, it, it could be convincing. So check out your photos from that time period. I like and, uh, it. I like it. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put a link in the show notes to the Google uh 
data location history thing where you can check your own out. Steve said that she didn't have that on for her, but um, but that is sort of an interesting thing to go and, and look at. Uh, they have a timeline where you can see where you've been based on your location history. And I'll just warn you, you might not like what you find, but it's fascinating. So anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. So hopefully something's there, Steve. And if anybody has a, a thought, of course, send it into us. We would love to hear from you. Speaking of loving to hear from you, we have what I believe is going to be a geek challenge. I think we've got a couple things to offer, but I don't think we have the magic answer for Robert who writes, do you know of any app that will give me the name and address associated with the owner of a phone number or at least the name of the owner? I have used any who in the past, but I don't seem to be able to find it or any other uh, reverse phone number services, except that except those that charge for a one time use or offer an ongoing subscription at a large monthly fee. I don't know what he defines as large, but I would be interested in this. I if I need to look up, you know, who's calling me or whatever, I, I usually use Google and just put the phone number into it, which is an interesting thing. It it won't always it, it's not it's maybe 40 percent effective in my use case. Uh, so it, but you know, sometimes you can see the number and be like, ah, okay, got it. You know, somebody will post the number on their website or it's associated with, you know, some, you know, Craigslist post that they made or something like, you know, things like that make it easier to tie people directly to numbers like, aha, gotcha. Uh, other than that, I don't really use it, but I don't have a desire slash need to use it all that often. Uh, I would love to know and I'd love you folks to to tell us john what do you what do you use for this scenario um usually if i get a number that i think is spam i'll just punch it into safari which hands it off to google and yeah. more often than not it comes up with a directory of uh spammers right yes it, right if you see a people long, will report yeah, exactly. the people will report the number and say yeah it's you know some guy selling this or that so yeah. um yeah um, I mean, the other thought is there are localized directories. And actually, I was looking here. So I did have Frontier at one point, and now I don't. Mm. I have it with, uh, I moved over to Optimum. But um, they have online directories for certain states. Um, unfortunately, though, I, I looked at their listing and they said, oh, by the way, we don't do reverse lookup anymore. <laughs> oh, interesting. Huh. So the local, if you have a general idea of where they are, are and who their provider is uh though, though you and i talked about this earlier um with a cell phone that that can be very difficult um with a landline it may not be as difficult since the area code and the first few numbers give you a general idea of where the person is right or where they were when they got the number right yes. i mean right because you can take a landline and and move it with you i mean we took our land, it's a great case in point, right? We we had a landline here in uh, New Hampshire, and then we moved it from, I think it was Verizon or Frontier or something like that, uh, to a Comcast number. We ported it in, but still in the same house. And then to stop paying Comcast, what, a year and a half, two years ago or something, we migrated it to uh, a Google Voice number, and now it's as virtual as we would ever want it to be. I have it attached to one of those little, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the company off the top of my head, the little device that lets you plug your- Uma? Google. Uma. Is that right? No. Is it? Uh, I don't think so. No. No. I. It's a, it's a one-time purchase device. Gosh, why can't I think of it off the top of my head? I'll find it. Um, but- uh, we have it plugged in and and now it, it the device has three ports, power, Ethernet and phone and, you know, plug it into Ethernet and it connects to my Google voice account because I gave it the, um, you know, the, the the credentials to log in. And it then feeds into my house's old landline phone system and everything just works. It's great. Works really well. Why can't I think of the name of it off the top of my head? It is kind of like Uma, but it's it's not Uma. It's um, something else. I'm looking in here to see if I've got it in my. Oh, it's the OB 200. OBI 200. OBI 200. Oh, right. Yeah. And that's from it's from OB Talk, but I think like Plantronics owns them now or something like that. 
but uh, but I'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's awesome. I it, I mean, it's it. I bought it for I don't know, let's say forty nine dollars, maybe fifty dollars, whatever. And and that's it. Like it just works. So there's no you know, there's no monthly fee. Google doesn't charge me a monthly fee to have a number there. It was a little bit of a trick getting the number there because you can't port or at least you couldn't. And I don't I, I don't think you can still you can't port from Google to uh, from Comcast directly to Google. You can only port into Google from a cell carrier. So I had to get a temporary T-Mobile SIM for like three dollars. And I ported from Comcast to T-Mobile. And then once that was finished, I could port from T-Mobile to Google. And then and then I canceled the T-Mobile account and the Comcast portion. And, you know, all was was good. So anyway, that was more than uh, more than you folks bargained for, wasn't it? But, you know, hey, that's how we do it. This is how we do it here, John. You scratch your head. We scratch ours. That's how it works. Right. No, wait. That's, is that how it works? I don't know. Uh, you scratch your head, scratch I'll scratch head. mine. Yeah, you scratch your head, I'll scratch mine. That's right. Or something like that. Uh, so let us know. And you already know the, the regular email address. If you're a premium listener, send us uh, a, a note to premium at MacGeekab.com if you have any reverse phone lookup thoughts or services or anything that you use. Even if they are a paid service, send it in. It would be good to kind of put a button on this conversation and, and have the options, the best options available there. Speaking of premium subscribers, I we have not done this for a couple of shows here, uh, largely because we've had so much stuff to pack in. But I did want to take a minute and thank uh, many of our premium subscribers whose contributions have come in recently. So I will try to get through this list and I might have to defer some of it to the next episode just to play catch up a little bit. But on our monthly $10 plan, and of course you can learn all about this at MacGeekab.com slash premium uh, or just at MacGeekab.com. There's a link there as well. But for, it's for those of you who want to support the show directly. Uh, it is, of course, not mandatory. We answer. We try to answer everybody's questions, but the folks on the premium list get a special premium at MacGeekab.com address that uh, that does get priority, especially when things get crazy and hairy and, and busy. Thanking those on our monthly ten dollar plan whose contributions have come in recently. Tony from San Francisco, Frederick from Nashville, Robert from Columbiana. Joseph from Marietta, James from Melville, Jeff from Chesterton, Clive from Burgess Hill, Scott from Bourbonnais, David from Mount Prospect, Barry from hopefully at home with his family for the holidays, Michael from Robbins, Ken from Honolulu, Frank from Tunbridge, John from Wake Forest, Santiago from Palm City, John from Sinking Spring, Jim from San Jose, Dave from Saugerties, Jeffrey from West Haven, Timothy from Hendersonville, Bob from La Peche, Tim from Des Moines, Philip from Tucson, Chris from Chorleywood, Michael from Mission Hills, Ari from Kensington, Joe from El Dorado, Jay from Long Valley, James from San Antonio, Bob from Working Smarter for Mac users in Austin, and Peter from Auburn, all on the monthly $10 plan. Thank you to all of you. And on the biannual $25 uh, every six-month plan, thanking Jeffrey from Alamogordo, Richard from Sands Point, Karen from Sugarden Falls, Robert from Pontesbury, Joe from Kingsley, Kurt from Princeton, Warren from Thompson Station, Terrence from Avon Lake, Brett H. and Antonio B., both of whom are pay longtime PayPal customers, so we don't have address data, Barry from Delray Beach, Peter from Bayside, Richard from Melbourne, Thomas from Shoreview, Chuck from Boulder at $50 every six months. Thanks, Chuck. Russell from Marblehead, Stacy from Pine Valley, Richard from Brooklyn, Anders from Vosteras, Phil from Santa Fe, Kenneth from New Lambden, John from Ypsilanti, Larry from Irvine, Deborah from Houston, Paul from Danville, Lyndon from Seven Oaks, Michael from Wake Forest, Charles from Kobe, Gary from McKee's Rocks, Thomas from Chicago, Keith from Kirby Cross, Chuck from Mechanicsburg, and James from Charlotte. Thanks to all of you. You rock. Again, MacGeekUp.com slash premium if you want to learn more about that. All right, John, some quick tips for everybody. How about that? Yeah? Outstanding. Outstanding. You are a man outstanding in your field or in your yard, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you're not in your yard right now. It seems pretty quiet. So I think you're in your, in your studio slash office, but what do I know? You could be anywhere. 
You could be in Bangladesh for all I know. Are you in Bangladesh, John? Never been there. Hmm. That's what you say. That's what they all say. All right. Uh, Jeremy says, did you know that if you're in the contacts app, highlight a contact and hold down the option key when on that contact and it will highlight the groups that it that that contact is in, which is fascinating to me. I had no idea. So if you highlight somebody and you have some groups or whatever, you just hold down the option key and if you are, you got to have view show groups on so that you can see your contact groups on the left and whatever contact is highlighted. And it, does it work with multiple contacts? It does not. It needs to be one contact that is highlighted and it will show you all the groups that these people are, or that person rather is in. I had no idea. Love it. It's great. So thank you, Jeremy. Good stuff. Any thoughts on that, John? No, it's neat. It is neat. I agree. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tony sends in another quick tip. Uh, he give he gives credit where it's due. Of course, uh, Max Sales, Otherworld Computing's blog, has articles that they post all the time. And Dennis Sellers posted a great article uh, that Tony sent to us about how to increase or decrease the zoom level in macOS Safari. As Tony points out, most people but though not everybody knows that command plus, which can also be command equals. So you're not holding down the shift key command plus and command minus will allow you to zoom the entire web page in and out in Safari and in many other apps too. However, adding the option key to that. So command option plus or command option minus restricts the zoom to text only. So it leaves the images where they are and only zooms text in or out which I find really interesting. I had no idea that was there. And he says what the article doesn't mention is that command zero returns the web page to its normal size. So a great uh, set of uh, zoom tips on uh, uh, for Safari. I had no idea about the command option to just zoom text. I love it. It's great. I know. This is what we love about the quick tips. It makes it really easy to hit those five new things every week because they're quick. Uh, lastly, Neil sends us a note. He says, uh, I know you've been talking about where to find your serial numbers. And of course, you can find some of them online and you can find your serial numbers for your Apple devices in your um you know, on the devices themselves. Generally, he says, I have tried to keep track of the serial numbers for my various Apple products in case I ever need to prove that they were mine and I can't directly get to the involved device. He says, but of course, I never remember to keep that list up to date. And I try to do the same thing. And of course, Neil's reading Neil's note here reminds me that I have not put the serial number for my new Apple watch in my database for of those sorts of things. He says, it turns out that if you go to the iCloud panel in system preferences uh, and the same is true, uh, he says he's doing this in Mojave. So there is one of those in uh, Catalina. You go to the Apple ID pane, which will have the same kind of thing. Uh, he says you uh, can see the devices panel in the iCloud one in Mojave and again, Apple ID. Uh, he says you'll see a listing of all the devices registered to your iCloud account. If you click on any one of those devices, you will get an informational display that includes the model, current OS version, and the serial number. This works not only for your Macs, iPhones, and iPads, but also for HomePods and Apple Watches. As long as you have a device registered to your iCloud account, this is a handy way of retrieving that device's serial number when you have access to a Mac, but not directly to the device in question. Of course, you can also get this at appleid.apple.com as well. So, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, handy on on my on devices that support them. It also shows what cards you have attached to that device. So it, you, if you have, like you know, for example, an Apple Watch, you can have all your cards, your, your iPhone can, your iPad can, your T2 equipped Max can as well, which makes life uh, a little bit easier so you can see what cards are attached and you can even remove cards from a device right from 
the system preference pane, at least in Catalina. So thanks for that, Neil. It's a good one. I like it. Handy, handy. Pretty good, right, John? Indeed. Indeed. All right. Um, let's go to Joe here. Joe asks, he says, uh, I was listening to episode 793 and both of you commented on how you store and backup photos. He says, I have a dilemma because my situation is a little bit different than yours. My wife has an old MacBook Pro with two, a 200 gigabyte photo library. She has a new MacBook Pro with a 256 gig SSD. He says, suppose it was my mistake to buy an SSD smaller than her photos library. Oh, well, maybe. He says, I have a 2016 MacBook Pro with a 512 gig SSD. And my photos library says is about 90 gigs. He says, I'm also relatively paperless and have a library of PDF documents also stored on the 15 inch MacBook Pro. I need to get the library off the old MacBook Pro and onto something more reliable. I'm worried about backups and automating them. I purchased a Synology, but he didn't say which model. He says, using either of the newer MacBooks seems like a nightmare to use to keep these photos uh local copies because I would have to use an external drive for the library and also an external time machine drive or carbon copy cloner or some location it says, but I can do time machine backups to the Synology uh, as I learn how to do this for sure. He says, I'm wondering if the best thing to do is to set up a new uh, iMac or Mac mini with a large enough hard drive for all the media files and attach an external drive to do continuous time machine backups. I could also have a second time machine instance running on the Synology that would give me two backups locally and the media would fit on the internal drive for now. Any thoughts about this? So my initial thought is to use iCloud photo library to store these things. Um, it does incur a monthly fee for storage, but it is so well integrated into iOS and Mac OS that it becomes nearly seamless and solves that I don't have enough storage problem fairly elegantly. Uh, that said, so I, I would I would strongly suggest and consider that that isn't the entire solution, though, or there might be some others. Depending on which Synology you, uh, disk station you have, you could try to do the same sort of thing with Synology moments, uh, saving yourself the monthly fee of iCloud uh, photo library. Uh, Synology Moments isn't quite as automatic and not nearly as well integrated with Mac OS, but it is doable in theory. You just have to run the app at, on your iPhone and have it pump all those photos into your Synology. And then it and then they are stored there and you are good to go. But, it you know, it's doable. The idea of a fixed machine, like you said, an iMac or a Mac mini with a drive to store everything is the best option if it's an option, uh, it's not always economically feasible to, you know, buy a new machine and dedicate it to just that, but it would work, especially if you were using iCloud photo library to get everything to that machine. I've run into some folks in a similar situation, Joe, and the thing, one of the things I've done for these folks where the only computers they have are laptops, which these days is not at all rare, uh, and either don't have enough storage on their laptops or want to store it differently is to use iCloud photo library and set it up so that you have two different user accounts, one that only stores, you know, the manage optimizes storage on your Mac and let that one store photos on the internal drive. That's fine. It will optimize in theory. It shouldn't fill up your Mac with with photos because it will manage that and then set up another user account, same iCloud uh, account, but make that user account store its photos on an external drive and download all originals. As long as and that way, you don't have to have the external drive connected all the time. You could say once a week, plug the external drive in, log into that user account, let it slurp everything down, check, make sure it's finished. Great log out of the user account and then eject that drive. And in theory, that's a way to manage it. I have some folks doing that. It does, of course, require the manual management of that, uh, that library. So, uh, you know, it's not perfect if you are the type of person that would forget to do this or wouldn't it heed your own calendar reminder to do it. Well, then this is not the right solution for you, but it is workable and saves you the money of buying a new, you know, Mac mini or something like that. So 
those are my thoughts. John, you have any thoughts to add on this? I kind of like the get something, put everything on a single machine. Oh, with sure. An internal drive that's large enough. Sure. It, if that's possible. In his case, he doesn't have that machine, right? He Correct. Right. He could. I mean, he mentioned getting an iMac or a Mac mini, but, you know, that I if I were if this were one of my consulting clients, I, I certainly would mention that as uh, an option. But I wouldn't necessarily lean somebody towards like, hey, go spend fifteen hundred dollars on, you know, a thing to store your photos like that seems a little overkill. But but if somebody's got the money <laughs> and that's what they want, that's great. Right. So. That's that's just, you know, it's, it's I'm not sure I would be hired all that often if the advice I kept giving people was, you know, well, you, you, yeah, your car needs an oil change. But did you see the new car over there? You know, go buy that one and, and then you won't need an oil change for six months and, and then we'll talk about your next car, you know, sort of thing. It's just like I feel like there's, you know, I feel like people hire me to, you know, to to find the creative solution, not the obvious expensive one. So that I don't know. but but I agree with you. Having that always on machine that does that. And maybe that's your old MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, right? The old machine. There's no reason that can't be always on just because it's a laptop. If you've got a place where it could be, you own the machine, hang an external drive off it, do it, let it do its time machine backups, even use carbon copy cloner to clone from that machine to your Synology so that your data is there. And you could even have moments slurp from that library. So now everything is like, like that might be a great solution because they've already got the machine. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, because my only concern is that it's a 2011. So, uh, but you know, to use it as a file server, essentially. Yeah. Um, it'll log into iCloud photo library. Like that's the, that's the, for this, that's the only thing you need. So, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. And then using, uh, you know, what both you and I do is, um, or at least I think you do, but, um, you know, uh, doing a, a time machine backup to the Synology is good and doing a CCC clone um, to b- replicate your uh, libraries is, is good as well. Yeah. To back them up. I, I do that. I do the the latter. I, I don't think I have time machine set to back up my photos. Um, but I, I do have carbon copy cloner set to copy it from my download everything library on my iMac in the office to the Synology disk station. So, so it's all there. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. A time machine last I checked, isn't too smart with, uh, I'll have to give it another world, but it's not too smart about figuring out the Delta in a photo library and yeah. the, the same with, um, virtual machines that are usually pretty large it's like oh let me back up the whole thing it's like whoa whoa it, you know it's just change this one little piece why are you why are you <laughs> yeah because i mean you know backing up you know tens or hundreds of gigs that you know t- especially wirelessly that's uh i've had that you know sometimes take a day <laughs> oh sure <laughs> oh yeah when i do the the initial backup yeah um, yeah crazy all right where are we here in time uh, what do we have? You know, we've had this connection with connection. I don't know why I said that word. We've had this question floating for a while and it's an important one. So, uh, with, with uh, new year's Eve coming up and people potentially going out and seeing bands and that sort of thing. Uh, Lewis asked, I think it's Lewis. I don't, I want to get your name right. Uh, no, Louis wrote and he says, uh, I have somewhat of an odd question, but Any suggestion for noise protection muffs? I'm looking for something comfortable. Um, So when 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 you say noise protection muffs, I'm thinking of like, you know, shooting headphones or whatever uh, or you're shooting ear protection where you're literally putting something over your ears. I those I don't have a ton of experience with in terms of of buying or suggesting because generally they are not built to let any sound in and, and they're not supposed to sound good. They're just supposed to be truly protective. So with that, I would just say go to, you know, Amazon or, or really anywhere and, and, and get yourself a set and make sure it's that they seal well on your ears and that they block. I would say at least 30 decibels, but, but if they can block more and they probably do that, that's even better for earplugs. Uh, and when I'm, 
recommending earplugs, I'm looking for something that simultaneously protects your hearing, but also reduces the volume levels in such a way that it still sounds like what you're intending to hear. So for concerts and even sporting events, I've worn earplugs. Where where were we recently? We were down in Nashville and we went to a, a football game there while we were looking at colleges and it was super loud in that stadium. And I happened to have earplugs in my pocket. And so I put them in. I was like, oh, this is great. You know, like the crowd and everything. It was like the announcer, like the way the speakers were aimed at us was just super loud. So put them in and I, that's, I wore those through the game. Um, for universal fit earplugs that aren't going to break the bank, my absolute favorites are from a company called Loop Earplugs. We found them at, at I think it was at CES a couple of years ago. But they are super comfortable. They fit well inside the ear. Uh, they kind of look cool for earplugs. You know, they've got like this little loop uh, that sort of sits inside your your ear. So it's not hanging out or anything, but it, it protects your ears. It looks, you know, again, somewhat stylish, you know, and the loop is a, a sound channel. So it really helps to. Uh, the, the 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 sound that you hear sounds like, you know, if you're at a concert or whatever, it sounds like the band. It's just lower volume because they're offering a 20 dB sound reduction, which is fantastic for earplugs like this. Uh, so they are they are my current favorites. I also like uh, Edemotic has been I mean, they've been, you know, a foundation of the hearing protection industry for a long time. They make their. I think they're called Eddie plugs. Now they've gone uh, for a variety under a variety of names, but they are also 20 DB uh, earplugs. They fit well inside the ears. They're triple flanged uh, tips. So they're a little more traditional in, in look uh, in terms of what you're, what you probably used to seeing and you can pop them in your ears and, and they will also block at a, they will reduce the sound pretty equally across the, the spectrum. So you can still, again, just like the loop ones, you can hear what you're, what you're going after. So loop earplugs and Eddie plugs would be my absolute favorite recommendations. And I suppose this does fit in with our, our conversation about the watch and the noise app earlier here. So it, it's, it's not the, the, the benefit of knowing that your hearing is potentially at risk is only helpful if you have a way to protect it. One way of course is to leave that environment. Another is to use something like these and, reduce the uh the level because if you if you're at 95 db and you lower that down to 75 db you're in good shape so that's that's what you want to do i use these uh i use earplugs i mean i have custom fit earplugs because i'm a because i use them all the time and i'm a crazy musician but um i you know i use them at gigs if i'm not using in-ear monitors which also block my hearing but um or block my, you know, block the external sound from coming in. You got to be careful with in-ear monitors that you don't turn them up too much because you can cause the same problem you're trying to avoid. But uh, I either use those on stage or if there's if I don't have the ability to use those and I have to use like monitor wedges or whatever, I put earplugs in. And um, it's really nice driving home from gigs without my ears ringing. So that's uh, and I, I highly recommend it for the people not on stage, too. So there you go. Any thoughts on that, my friend? It pains me when I see people that are wearing earphones and I can hear their music because I'm like, you may want to turn that down a bit. If I can hear it and their ear earplugs, <laughs> you're probably doing some damage. Though, though I know a lot of devices these days um, limit the, the the output volume, so so you won't go deaf. But, um, yeah, maybe a lot of a lot of um, ear headphones, including earbud style headphones, will. Uh, leak sound out pretty terribly. In fact, uh, with when we have people on, you know, we, well, we'll have a guest on this podcast next week. But when we have guests on other podcasts, we have to tell them use headphones that seal in your ears because with a microphone that close to your ear, uh, you it's very common to have bleed over from like Apple's ear pods. Those do not seal in your ear. Original generation AirPods, you know, the only the AirPods Pro seal in your ears. Regular AirPods do not. And you can definitely hear people, you know, hear the sound coming out. And it's not necessarily because they have it too loud. It's just a function of the way those things are built. They, they tend to spill sound 
in all directions, not just directed into the ear. But when I get on an airplane and I see somebody with regular AirPods and then I know they have to crank them up to get them over the, you know, whatever, you know, the, the 85 decibel din of an airplane. I always feel like, oh, man, like I wish I had something to give you to 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 protect your hearing because you're going to hurt yourself doing that for five hours or whatever. So, yeah, I'm with yep. you. Yeah. Other than that, I like the uh, ETY. Uh, yeah. I think you, you convinced me to get some of those before you and I went to uh, a concert. Yes. yes. At first, I was questioning. I'm like, what? Are you telling me that the sound that they're going to have at a live concert is so loud that it could damage my hearing? And the answer is yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. hundred percent of the time almost. Yeah. Yeah. There are some bands out there that really try to keep things, you know, below 90 decibels, but it, it, a, it's tough. B that feeling of, you know, feeling like the subwoofers are moving you and that sort of thing at, at some level is part of the, you know, certainly the rock concert experience. And, and it's not, if, if done properly, it's not dangerous at all. But, you know, to balance things, things are going to be a little louder. Plus, you're going to have people around you talking and that sort of thing. And in order to sort of mitigate that, they just generally bring the, the level up a little bit so that, um, so you know, so that the sound translates with, with um, like line arrays and stuff. Now, it's not like it used to be where you just had one set of speakers at the stage that everybody was hearing from. Now you'll see those things if you go to concerts or or even just, you know, public events where somebody's speaking. They're called line arrays and, and they y- y- usually are look like a series of uh, flat, uh, you know, horizontal speakers that sort of curve as they're hanging down. Each one of those is its own speaker and each one of those is tuned to the specific area at which it is aimed. It's very they are all very directional. And the beauty of that is the ones that are aimed at the people in the front row are much quieter than the ones that are aimed at the people in the back row. So you don't have to blow the ears off of the people down front just to get sound all the way to the back, which really changed the whole picture of everything, because it means you can EQ differently for different corners of the room. It's, it's quite fascinating. It so much it works so well that if you go to a concert or any kind of event like that and you can't hear at your seat, that is their fault. That is a very easily solvable problem. And it means they didn't put in the work to tune to the room ahead of time. And you probably should, you know, like get your money back or something because you should be able to hear perfectly everywhere, especially inside an arena or something like that, because they can really tune it. So that's my that's my rant for now. And I guess that that brings us to the outro, my friends. It's time, Mr. Braun. It's time for us to say Happy New Year to everybody. It's the last time we're going to talk in 2019. It's just how it goes. Right? Uh, I suppose. Yeah? Yeah. No, at least this calendar. Right? Is there another calendar that, that goes to 2019? No, no, I guess. There's, tons of, there's yeah. tons of different calendars. I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Are there calendars that are newer than the Gregorian one that we are operating within? I think like, that's that's the latest release. <laughs> yeah. So, well, no. What I'm saying is, is are, are there calendars that that are that are still on like you know year less than 2019? I know there's calendars that are on years more than 2019, but but are, do we have any that you know start like is there the calendar of Dave that starts the year I was born, and so this is year you know whatever 40 something? I don't even know how old I am anymore, mm-hmm. but whatever. Like, is there that? Could you, I guess we could all do that. Then it'd be really interesting. Like, you know, what, what year is it for you? You're just asking people based on their birth year. So that'd be a little weird. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's I don't think that's a good idea. Thanks for listening, though. Thanks for everything. Thanks for a, another great year, everybody. We um, we love getting to be able to do this. And um, even even the work that we put in to do it, I find, you know, super enjoyable. It's it's really I love helping people. I love answering questions. I love learning new things. Uh, I love finding out that what I previously thought was right is wrong. I, like it's all it's it's the evolution keeps the mind limber doing this show, which is, you know, as our as our years advance is a good thing. So it's good. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you, Mr. Braun. Thanks to all of our listeners. Happy New Year to everybody. Thanks to our sponsors, of course, for this episode was Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. I mentioned our CES sponsors, which also includes Amazing Text Expander and Carbon Copy Cloner. 
all of our other podcast marketplace sponsors, linode.com slash MGG, eero.com slash MGG, barebones.com, smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Our thanks to Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com. We told you how to contact us via email, John. What's another method? Pick one. Um, I've been seeing stuff on the Twitters. Um, all right. So you can tweet. Um, I am John F. Ron. He is Dave Hamilton. Mac Geek Abs, the podcast. Mac Observers, the publication. And you can tweet at Pilot Pete. He's at Pilot Pete. There you go. Happy New Year, everybody. Have uh, have fun. Have uh, have a good time all the time. Right? Wasn't that the Spinal Tap drummers? Uh, Motto, creed, something like that. Or was that uh, the keyboard player? It might have been the keyboard player. Gotta get my spy. I gotta watch Spinal Tap again. That's what I gotta do. Maybe on the airplane out to CES. And no matter what you do, make sure that you follow our advice. What I believe is the best advice we could give to anyone, and that is. Don't get caught. Happy New Year, everybody. See you on the other side.